Hi, my name is April Hewlett with the University of Idaho, and today we're going to talk a little bit about the history of range management. We can't talk about all of rangeland management history today, but we can highlight some of the major events that happened. We're going to break it down into various different eras as we work through uh, a timeline. We're going to start with the era of Native Americans, and then we're going to move to explorers and trappers. We'll then go into settlers and pioneers, followed by rangeland science. Throughout these times, we also can start to see the formation of the federal government concerning land management. Following range science, we have the birth of land management, where we have the Taylor Grazing Act and the Soil Conservation Act. We also can see that the BLM is being formed. We then move to an era of environmental policies, and we're going to say that's from about 1960s up until now. We're going to break those eras down into smaller units, starting with the Native Americans. Here you can see a list of tribes in Idaho. They really focused on survival. That means hunting and gathering, or, and they heavily used the natural products. Native Americans had horses. They brought horses in and the horses grazed the rangelands. The effects of this influenced how we manage lands now as well as then. Native Americans used fire. They used fire to increase the availability of desired plants, maintain habitats for animals used as food, and to drive game during hunts. This painting depicts fire being used to herd buffalo on the prairie, but it also was used for other game in the western U.S., such as for hunting rabbits and deer. Early explorers and trappers were known for several different things. Cortez and Coronado came up through the southwest or the Sea of Cortez and were the first to introduce livestock into North America. 300 or so years after Cortez and Coronado, we have the Lewis and Clark Expedition. Lewis and Clark had two main objectives. One, to explore and map newly acquired territory, and two, to study the area's plants, animal life, and geography, and establish trade. These lands were largely unmanaged, and this exploration led way to roads and trails being created and set the stage for development. Following the explorers and the trappers, settlers and pioneers made their way to the west. The Oregon Trail and its many offshoots were used by about 400,000 settlers between 1840 and 1860. These settlers were looking for new land and opportunities on the frontier. They included farmers and miners, ranchers and business owners, and their families. Only about 80,000 ended up in Oregon. Many broke off on the route and ended in Wyoming or Idaho or traveled to California and Utah. The gold rush brought about 100,000 miners to California. Some of these ended up in Idaho. Between 1861 and 1866 in Idaho, nearly $24 million worth of gold was found in the Boise Basin mining area. This led to Boise being named the capital city of Idaho. As people continue to establish in the West, the Homestead Act of 1862 was established. This is an interesting act, especially considering that it was issued during the Civil War. In this act, the government gave public land to the West, usually 160 acres, to U.S. citizens that were willing to settle on and farm the land for at least five years. U.S. citizens were considered anyone who had not taken up arms against the U.S. government, had, um, it could include freed slaves, and they had to be at least 21 years old or at least the head of the household. It's kind of interesting to look at the expansion into the West, but also consider the politics that are going on with the Civil War. So imagine for a second that you are, you are participating in the Homestead Act. What is one of the factors that you would consider when you were going to establish a homestead? Hopefully you thought of water. Water is essential to life. Water is needed to irrigate the land, water is needed for livestock, water is needed to sustain our own lives. 
When we look at land ownership and management maps, no matter where we are throughout the West, here's one for Idaho, we can see that private pieces of land, here indicated in orange, are often adjacent to springs and streams. This becomes really important, especially when we start thinking about how we manage landscapes today. If our private land is around the water, where do you think a lot of our wildlife species are located? Right, also on private lands. So with the Homestead Act, they got 160 acres, but this soon proved to be not enough land to support a livelihood. John Wesley Powell was one of the first explorers to map the West and to really state that this is not going to be enough land to sustain life in the West. He suggested that it should be larger. And in fact, he suggested 2,560 acres. So quite a bit larger than the original 160 acres. As you can see here in this quote, John Wesley Powell also identified one of the major conflicts that we see in the West, and that is water rights and water. Water is definitely the limiting factor in most of our ecosystems. Over time, we started to see an increase in the amount of acres that were given. In 1909, we have the Enlarged Homestead Act, which increased the acres from six, 160 to 320 acres. Followed by that, we have the Stock Raisers Homestead Act in 1916, and this increased acres to 640 as long as you had more than 50 head of cattle. Another act that's influenced how we manage rangelands today in the West is the Morrell Act of 1862. The Morrell Act dedicated lands, specifically section six and 36 of every township, to universities as part of the land grant mission. At Idaho, the University of Idaho is our land grant college. If you look at the map, you can see that there's a checkerboard pattern between state of Idaho lands, there's some checkerboard in private lands. Basically, the Morrell Act allowed states to sell that land and to collect the funds and put them in an endowment to support the land grant missions. If you click on the hyperlink, the Boiler Bites, you can learn more about the Morrell Act. With the Transcontinental Railroad being completed in 1869, travel to the West became easier. Mining and the railroad initiated markets for livestock production. Hence, livestock production boomed. Livestock were put on open ranges or areas that were good for grazing but were never claimed under the Homestead Act primarily because there, there was no water source. With this increase in livestock production, we ultimately face the tragedy of the commons on rangelands. And basically what that's referring to is when land stewardship was non-existent. People just wanted to be the first to get their animals to the open range regardless of the impact they had on the sustainability of the natural resources. So we saw a lot of rangeland degradation or overgrazing during this time period. One of the factors that contributed to the tragedy of the common was the fact that cattle were sold by the head and not the pound following the Civil War. So if you think about that, how would that influence cattle ranching? Essentially, the beef was a byproduct. More importantly, the hides were sold off to the leather industry for belts for industrial machinery in the East. So these cows caused massive degra degradation on the range. Today, cows are sold by the pound. Livestock must be in good condition to be sold. So we already have seen a shift and a reversal in what caused the tragedy of the commons. By 1886, drought, low cattle prices, and several bad winters pretty much ended the open range livestock era. Open range led to range wars, and particularly in the 1880s and 1890s, rangelands have a rich history of range wars and conflict. There were multiple kinds of range wars. Here's a sign from Eastern Idaho where they talked about armed cattlemen um, at war with settlers who wanted to plant crops. They both wanted the same resources and they wanted to use them differently, hence they had conflicts. One that you're probably familiar with is the sheepmen versus the cattlemen. To think about this one, we have to consider a few different things. At this time, why were sheep considered such a nuisance on the lands? 
How does herding the sheep differ from the cattle? All of this played into the part of, um, played a factor in these range wars. So unlike cattle, sheep stay together for the most part. Thus, fences are not always needed and the herders can move them around to the best places to graze most efficiently. Cattlemen could not do this. Cattlemen had to claim areas for their ranches. Hence, when sheepmen would come and use their resources, they felt threatened and they felt like they would have a loss, which they probably would. So cattlemen uh, killed a lot of sheepmen during this time and they poisoned millions of sheep. There were losses on the cattle side as well, but the sheepmen definitely were more impacted. The 1910 fires are one of the most important events in history for fire policies and for the U.S. Forest Service and rangelands. In two days, this firestorm burned 3 million acres and caused over 85 fatalities. If you click on the top on the link that's the big burn of 1910, you'll be taken to a short video. It's less than five minutes. But it's worth watching because it describes what this event was like. And you can imagine what it was like in, fire, in 1910 with limited fire suppression techniques. At least nowadays we have a lot more options. This led to complete fire suppression policies and eventually Smokey the Bear's message that only you can prevent forest fires. Although at the time it's understandable why you would want a complete fire suppression policies, we know in the long run that fuel management and fire is a natural part of our ecosystem and has to be managed for. In range, we face a lot of fuel buildup because of these suppression policies as well, and they also experience that in forests. Rangeland science is a fairly new science, and one of the first scientists was Arthur Sampson, and he is often considered the father of rangeland ecology. He had a lot of firsts. He was the first person in America to be called a range ecologist. He was the first to write a college text on range management. He was the first range ecologist hired by the Forest Service. And he did a lot of the foundational work that helped us understand different management strategies and techniques that we use today, especially concerning grazing, plant succession, and erosion. It's always interesting to look at some of the early work of these early scientists in range ecology. And Arthur Sampson did some really interesting work that is still intact today, and you can actually go visit some of his research plots. There have signs and, and postings of, of what happened. This example is in Ephraim Canyon, which is in central Utah. So basically, they had a lot of erosion in and the town of Ephraim, and you can kind of get a sense of that on the picture of the, on the left. And the question is, is why are we getting this erosion? How can we stop it? They also had high numbers of sheep at the time. And so Arthur Sampson did a, a pretty basic study, but still a study that has influenced a lot of how we manage rangelands today. He basically set up two different exclosures. One, he removed grazing, and one, he didn't remove grazing. And he looked at vegetation characteristics in these two different exclosures and looked at the uh, runoff and erosion that occurred due to different grazing practices and strategies. And obviously he found that when we overgraze, we increase the amount of bare ground, we lower our vegetation and our erosion potential increases. He also looked at terracing, as you can see in the picture on your right, in a strategy to maintain water in different areas and again to reduce the risk of erosion potential. So basic studies but influenced a lot of our grazing management practices today. So the birth of public land management happened early on in U.S. history and you don't have to remember the dates but it's kind of interesting to see the order and the the way that these organizations were um, put together and how they're functioning today. So the Department of Defense has over 14.4 million acres of military land. Not all of this land is rangelands, but there is a significant chunk, especially here in Idaho, Idaho that is rangelands. The Bureau of Indian Affairs was established in 1824. It has over 55 million surface acres of land, some of which is rangelands, and also has significant amounts in mineral states. <laughs> 
The U.S. Forest Service was established in 1905. They manage over 193 million acres of national forests and grasslands. The National Park Service was 1916. They have over 84 million acres of national parks. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was actually put together in 1940. Sometimes people suggest that this was a little bit earlier, but actually the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is a con was formed when they combined the Bureau of Fisheries with the Bureau of Biological Surveys. And when that formed, we have the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The Bureau of Land Management was formed in 1946, and similar to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, it was two different offices that were merged together to create the Bureau of Land Management. And those offices were the General Land Office and the U.S. Grazing Service. The BLM is always unique. We often just think about it on the surface area, and that's about 200 and over 245 million acres they manage. But they also manage over 700 million acres of subsurface minerals, and so that's a huge component of the BLM. The Nature Conservancy was established in 1951 and is one of, um, of the most influential organizations or non-government um, organizations that manage lands. In the Idaho Department of Lands, they have over 2.4 million acres right now in Idaho, many of which are rangelands. Since the 1860s, grazing by sheep and cattle was free, and it was pretty uncontrolled, as we saw when we looked at open range and the range wars. The Taylor Grazing Act provided a mechanism to manage grazing by doing two different things. One, it asserted federal management of grazing practices, and two, it established a system of grazing rights and fees. This essentially ended homesteading. In order to stop injury in the public land, permits and fees were now required. Cattlemen promoted the Taylor Grazing Act. As we know from the range wars, they were tired of sharing resources with sheepmen who had more flexibility and could roam where its cattlemen couldn't do that. Leases on these public grazing lands often went to ranchers who could provide hay and water on nearby private lands. So again, removing some of the grazing from public land to prevent overgrazing and soil deterioration in the long run. A lot of sheep operators at this time were forced out of business and or many ranches were converted from sheep to cattle. Like the Taylor Grazing Act, the Soil Conservation Act has probably had the most impact on the conservation of rangelands. Its aim was to reduce soil erosion, and this came after the Dust Bowl or the Dirty Thirties. And I recommend reading The Worst Hard Time. It's one of my favorite natural resource books. It's super interesting, so I thought I'd throw that in. But anyways, the Soil Conservation Act was the birth of the Soil Conservation Service, which is now the Natural Resource Conservation Service, or the NRCS. As mentioned before, the Bureau of Land Management was formed in 1946 when the General Land Office merged with the U.S. Grazing Service. Since then, and throughout the 50s and 60s and even today, we've seen great improvement in our rangeland health. We're seeing less overgrazing. We're seeing water developments, invasive plant control. We can reseed after disturbances, and we've had a lot of advances in the science of range ecology. Along with advances in the science of range, we also have a lot of policies that started to happen in the 1960s to now. One of them is the Multiple Use Sustained Yield Act in 1960. Essentially, this act defined what multiple use was and, and stated that we need to manage for things like outdoor recreation, range, timber, watershed, and wildlife. Following this act, we had the Federal Land Policy and Management Act of 1976. This provided guidance on how to manage for multiple uses. In 1964, we had the Wilderness Act. This act represents the nation's highest form of land protection. It means that you can't have roads, we can't have vehicles or permanent structures in these designated wilderness areas. In Idaho, we have multiple designated wilderness areas, as you can see in this map. These wilderness areas are managed by Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, and the National Park Service. 
Here's a list of the ones in Idaho, and you can click on the Wilderness Connect link to go to maps of where they are specifically. Many of you have probably heard the term NEPA, or the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969. This is a policy that is still influences a lot of the management decisions we make today. It has many positive and negative attributes to it. Some of the positives are that it requires you to look and consider multiple actions before you make any kind of management decisions on the land. So you have to weigh the pros and cons and the options that you have to really decide what's going to be the best for that area. It also mandates that you have a public review period. And I would encourage you guys to Google NEPAs that are occurring around the area that you're in and get involved and make public review. This is a chance to comment positive things as well as concerns that you might have. The Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrow Act of 1971 is still an act that influences a lot of the management decisions we make on public lands today. You can see in this quote that Congress found wild free roaming horses and burrows to be symbols of the historic and pioneer spirit of the West. They said that they offer diversity of life forms and that we don't want to see these horses and burrows disappear from the American scene. In this act, it essentially offers protection, management, and control of wild free roaming horses and burrows on public land. This means that it protects them from capture, branding, harassment, and death. It also explains a little bit about what to do if you have excessive animals. The first things you have to do is one, inventory how many animals you have. You then have to set the appropriate management level to maintain the multiple resources on that rangeland. The third thing is that you have to develop strategies to achieve that management level. This can mean that you might have to use sterilization or some kind of natural controls on population levels. The Endangered Species Act is one of the acts that you might be more familiar with. This was issued in 1973 and it's designed to protect and recover imperiled species and the ecosystems upon which they depend. So not only is it concerned with individual species, but also the ecosystem or the habitat at which they depend. This became a pretty big issue for multiple different species. One of the most recent ones in the West is the sage grouse. In 2015, ESA was no longer warranted for the sage grouse and it was not listed as a candidate species. This can change, but hopefully with the conservation partnerships that have occurred across the Western United States, we can keep the bird from being listed. The Clean Water Act in 1977 may be an act that you're somewhat familiar with. In this act, it established the basic structure and regulation for pollutants in the water in the United States and also regulated quality standards for surface waters. On rangeland, our main pollutant is sediments, which occur following runoff events. So we want to make sure that we have healthy ecosystems where we minimize sediment flows or erosion runoff as much as possible. The Public Range Improvement Act of 1978 reaffirms the nation's policy and commitment to inventory and identifying current rangeland conditions and trends. This is important because it shows that we want to maintain and improve our conditions on our public rangelands so that we can maintain and sustain the natural resources that we need to meet society's need. It also reaffirms the need to protect wild free roaming horses and burrows and charge a fee for public grazing. Public grazing is calculated on a yearly basis and a few of the things that go into that calculation include the current private grazing land lease rate, beef cattle prices, and the cost of livestock production. It has also other factors that if you're interested in, you can go into the act and find. In 2017, the AUM, or an animal unit month, is $1.87. This is a little bit lower than it was in 2016. In 2016, it was $2.11. In recent years, it seems like we get more and more secretarial orders that help us understand different rangeland policies and practices. Secretarial orders are decisions on important topics that come from the Secretary of the Interior or the Secretary of Agriculture, for example. Here are three in recent years that have affected how we manage rangelands quite significantly. Secretarial Order 3336 came from um, Secretary Jewell in January 2015. In this order, 
It talks about rangeland fire prevention, management, and restoration. And it all kind of circles around sage grouse and the habitat that sage grouse has. It gives us action steps that we can take and helps us interpret some of the past policies and practices. 3353 and 3354 are really recent orders. They came in June and July of 2017 from Secretary Zinke. 3353 revolves around sage grouse conservation and the cooperation in the western states. We saw a great or a lot of conservation partnerships which have been really positive. Um, in July 2017, they ordered 3358, and this looks at um, oil and gas exploration on federal lands. And if you remember, when we think about uh, the BLM and that it manages over 700 million acres of mineral estates, this is really um, an important secretarial order. These are all linked to different PDFs, so if you click on them, you can read these orders. They're very short, two or three pages, but they just provide extra guidance. So that was a really, really brief look into some of the history and the policies that dictate how we manage rangelands today. It is obviously a very complex subject and we barely skim the surface of many of the acts that we talked about. If you're interested in any of them, I would encourage you to go and look at these acts. They're very fascinating. And also consider the history. When we're trying to manage different things, we have to understand where we came from. It's important to remember what open range were. It's important to realize that there was a time when we had overgrazing, but we have taken corrective action since then, and we're definitely on a positive trajectory for our rangeland health. It's an exciting future. We'll continue to have policy change as we go forward, but I think there's good things ahead. So whatever you think, whether it's good or bad, it all depends on what your philosophies are for land management. And I would encourage you to critically think about the things that we talked about and to think about how that would influence how you manage the land in the future.